public classes. Um, so this is plan your summer food garden. Uh, and I think you're gonna really enjoy this. It's a great day. People are, I was just today myself in my garden saying, okay, I gotta get my seeds going, get, get them into the ground. So I think we're all in the same time frame here. So Delisha, you wanna move ahead on the next slide? Just uh, some Zoom housekeeping for us all. We, uh, we ask in today's session that you keep your microphone muted and you keep your video off. Um, it does just help in terms of the amount of um, bandwidth is to help um, keep us all able to stay in. Um, and also use your speaker view. That's really, so whoever is speaking, you'll see them primarily. Um, and as Delise just recommended, we do recommend that you maybe bring open your chat window to the side and you can use that for questions. And we will be answering questions at the end of the program mostly. So uh, keep that there. Now, some other tips. Um, there's a closed caption button. There should be at the bottom of your screen. And if you are having difficulty hearing, please uh, open that. And for technical assistance, please chat directly to me. So again, in the chat room, you can write at the bottom, it says who you are going to chat with. And uh, rather than chatting with everybody, if you're having technical, just chat directly to me, Trink. Um, and after class, we'll say this a couple of times, you'll get this full presentation and link to the video. So you don't have to take too many notes because um, you'll get all of that afterwards. And also know that, notice that there's a reactions button at the bottom of your screen. So if you're asked to raise your hand, there's a place there to do that. Okay. And so that's the technical stuff. Let's get ahead with the fun stuff, who we are. We're UC Cooperative Extensions, Master Gardeners in Monterey and Santa Cruz County. Uh, and we are about education. We um, extend the research-based knowledge from the university and inform uh, and information on home horticulture, excuse me, home horticulture, pest management, and sustainable landscape practices to the home gardener. So UC Cooperative Extension reaches out to the farmers and the master gardeners where we take that same information and reach out to you guys, the home gardeners. So um, next slide. And you have two outstanding instructors this morning. You're very lucky, lots of experience, and I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. Delise. Hello, I'm Delise Weir. I've been a master gardener since 2014, and I've been growing food long enough to learn from many, many mistakes. Hopefully you will also get to learn from your mistakes or have fewer of them after this class. I love to teach. Joy? I'm Joy, and I've been a master gardener since 2018. I've been gardening for about 30 years, and I love to grow food, flowers, herbs, and uh, build habitat, and I'm excited to share my knowledge. Next slide. So thank you to those of you who filled out the pre-class survey results, and we wanted to share those with you. Um, we got 25 responses, and many of you have an existing food garden space. We learned that a significant number of you are beginners, with half of you, been, and then over half of you have been growing in the same space for some time. Um, and then 36% of you are adding to your growing area or in trying to start a new bed. And many of you are just beginners, 72%, 16% intermediate, and 12% experienced, or I will say seasoned um, gardeners. <laughs> and the overall, um, the overall idea that you wanted to learn was to interest in getting the most out of your constrained space, which we all have. We never have enough space as gardeners. Okay. So the learning objectives today, um, by the end of this class, you should have the tools and knowledge to lay out and plan a small vegetable garden with appropriate planting dates and timing. Um, we think it's going to be um, applicable to both beginning gardeners and experienced gardeners who want to maximize yields. I think um, gardening, learning gardening is a journey. You're always learning something new. Um, there's always new apps that are coming out that might help. And, you know, I'm always learning. I know Delise is always learning every year. Um, and I'm curious. Oh, yes. Thank you, Delise. Um, we will send you the slide deck with the links. 
and a copy of a uh, link to this recording also. Um, we have, I'm kind of curious if there are master gardeners in the audience um, and could you raise your hand, your, your digital, your Zoom hand, um, <laughs> if you're a master gardener? I'm seeing two, three. I'm only seeing three. I don't believe that. I think there's more. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe we have some shy master gardeners. In any case, there's many, many decades of experience in this room. And if you ever see us in the wild, you know, we're happy to share our knowledge um, if you have any questions. Next slide. In the wild. <laughs> so, this is the um, outline of what we're, we're gonna be sharing today. So Delise and I will be walking through the key pieces of information that every gardener needs to know um, to have a successful garden. And because we are in our very special Monterey Bay um, area, we have um, some tips for growing things like tomatoes that may not show up in um, kind of the published literature. So we'll be dropping those, those hints in uh, throughout the presentation. So you'll need to know your garden goal, uh, your garden goals. Um, we weren't going to ask you to observe your site. That includes your location, um, your zone, solar exposure, orientation, drainage, soil, and layout. Then we'll go over the plants you intend to grow and their botanical needs, because that's very important, obviously. And then what you had asked is, you know, when when to plant, what to plant when, and we're definitely going to go over that. So date ranges for planting from seed and for transplant, we have uh, resources for that, and date ranges for harvest. So the first question is, what are your goals for your veggie garden? And we're going to have our first poll. It's going to be multiple choice, and we want you to choose your top three. So why are you here today? Um, so the choices will be supplement the family food budget, provide a consistent harvest from the garden, find out when to plant what, grow what I'd like to eat, grow unique varieties I can't find at the store, grow extra produce so you can preserve them for later, learn what works well in my yard, and to maximize yield. And I will launch the poll. So please choose your top three and we'll give like a, a minute or so. Is everybody seeing the poll? I am not seeing the poll. Yes, I'm seeing yes. it. Yes. Okay, that's what matters. <laughs> Yep. Okay, we've got about 80% of you participating already. So guess we'll five more seconds and I'll close the poll. All right, 10%, five more seconds. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna end the poll here and let's see what you said. So learn what to plant when, a consistent harvest from the garden, and then learn what works well in my yard and then grow what I'd like to eat. They're on the fur. Right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So we have a real world case study and it is Delise's actual front yard no one geolocate where she lives. Um, and uh, I'll hand it off to Delise. What a mess that front yard is. So um, I have two 25, it's actually 24 and a half square foot beds um, that are currently cover cropped with a few bien biennial flowers and some very sad peppers trying to overwinter here in the front. Um, and I'm going to ask your help filling them out with um, a salad garden and 
a salsa garden. So we're going to talk about the process to go through to do that. And at the end, we're going to come up with some garden designs. Now, this section started out as site selection. But I find that a lot of home gardeners, uh, they don't choose their site, their site chooses them. So people um, have to adapt to the space they have in their backyard and that can be challenging. So um, all of this is like best possible practice and may not be possible for you, but we'll go through um, some of the things you could consider. And we're gonna call it site analysis because most of you already have a place where you're growing food. Um, if you're starting from scratch, this will also be valuable. So first thing to do is you take a piece of paper and a pencil and you walk outside and you just draw a artistic, not perfect, not to scale, uh, diagram of your growing area with any permanent structures, any buildings, trees, fences, roads, etc., that you're going to have to work around. So that's the first step is to just get the lay of the land. Light, let there be light. There needs to be a lot of light. And 68 hours is kind of the minimum for uh, vegetable crops, most of them anyway, um, especially traditional summer vegetable crops like corn and tomatoes and peppers and that sort of thing. It's important to know how many hours your garden is getting on a daily basis. There are other things beside light that are important. There's um, making sure that there's a hose that reaches to where you're going. Uh, is there shade? We'll talk about how to map that. Is it on a slope? That can be an issue. Is, is it very windy? Depending on where you are, that could be a problem. Is the water table high and do you get a marshy backyard? I used to have a backyard that grew bamboo um, and it was literally underwater in the winter time. And do you know what your drainage is like? So we're going to go through how you figure that stuff out. But first we're going to talk about solar orientation. So if you watch the sun in your yard, and this happens slowly, kind of like the boiling a frog analogy, we don't pay attention to where in the garden we're getting shade in the winter and bright sun in the summer. It's, it's kind of hard to keep track of if you don't actually document it. And as you can see, solar angles drop towards the horizon in the winter, um, and that would be the south side in this hemisphere. And then they go higher up in the sky um, as it crosses across the sky in the summer. Of course, everybody knows that. But um, the key takeaway here is that north is where you would put your tallest plants because the sun is coming at an angle from the south. So if you want to go maximizing sunshine, you put your tall stuff on the north end, you put your shorter stuff on the south end, and, uh, and it goes east to west. Um, this is homework already. You get homework. So um, I've created a little map your sunshine exercise uh, where you take four days off a year, at least. You stay at home all day long watching the game or whatever it is you do. And you identify in the vertical axis on the left different parts of the garden. So this is the back corner garden, the front garden, the garden by the fence, different areas. And then you break up the um, horizontal axis across the top by hour. So you just go out and you check those garden areas every hour and you indicate, are they in shade, full shade? Are they in partial shade? Are they in full sun? And the idea is you want to count how many hours of full sun you have and it's also good to know whether it's morning or evening, morning or afternoon, because morning sunshine is more gentle than uh, afternoon sunshine. So this is downloadable. It's a template um, I, I give to you where you can put your location here in the A column. You've got your hours and it's recommended it be done basically now. Spring equinox is a great time to do this. And then at the very minimum, uh, do it again in the summer solstice. And you will be amazed at how, how different the hours of sunshine are. The fall equinox will be a lot like the spring equinox, I predict. And winter solstice, uh, it will be amazingly different. 
like those two beds in my front yard, one of them doesn't hardly get any full sun at all in the winter and full sun for about 12 hours a day in the summer. So go figure. So that's, uh, that's your homework to do. And at that point, you can get a little fancy. You can take your artistic drawing and apply measurements with the help of a graph, graph paper to scale. So you can, you know, make each little box be a foot or four boxes is a foot. Um, and uh, draw your rectangular beds that way. And then I recommend that you take your phone and download a compass application. Um, and if you really don't want to do that, it's very helpful. If you don't want to do that for whatever reason, Google Maps Street View has uh, will give you a general direction, north, south, east, west, and you can tell what it's like in your front yard. If you really want to get that orientation in your backyard or be more specific with it, then I recommend it, putting it on your phone. And it's it's fun to play with. So when you're picking your layout, um, these are some things to think about. Two foot pathways between beds. And I really mean two feet. It just always, to me, seems like a waste of space. I could be growing. Why isn't it just one foot? Well, try and get a wheelbarrow through that uh, when it's fully grown up. You will understand why it's two foot pathways. And beds should be no more than three to four feet wide. Now, can people, somebody in the chat, everybody in the chat, tell me why that is. Why do the beds need to be more, no more than four feet wide? What we can reach. Leaning back is bad for your, leaning over is bad for your back. Can't reach any further. Okay. You guys are geniuses. That is correct. Your arms are about two feet long. Your bed is about four feet wide. So if you can get to it from either side, then you can get into the middle and you've got it. Uh, we just talked about tall or climbing plants on the north side, so you can take advantage of all the sun on the south side. And um, you're just going to have to configure your rows, your beds, or your space, wherever you have space available. But if at all possible, lay out your beds north to south. Um, I have to say that in my backyard, I had some beds, they were just sort of mounded beds. They didn't have edges around them, so nothing permanent. And I had them east to west for years. And I read about orientation and I I turned them around. I did a complete redesign of my backyard so that I could go north to south. But it's really hard if you've already put the boards in and you have borders. Okay, we've done our measurements. We know we have a seven by three and a half foot bed here and here. We know the streets here. We know the house is throwing shade on bed number one. We know we can't plant in the parking area or on the walkway. Here's a barrel where I planted a tomato last year. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. And here's my solar orientation. So I know that it's, it's northish facing the street and it's southish facing the backyard. Um, so that's how I know where my son's going. Now, soil preparation is so much an important factor um, to your success and the health of your overall garden. And there's a whole class, several classes under themselves about that. So I'm just going to give you a couple of tips. I recommend, it's a bit of an investment, but I recommend doing a soil test. And um, a basic soil test checks three macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and 10 micronutrients, things like iron, calcium, magnesium, et cetera. Um, the percentage of organic matter, the pH of your soil, and a good one will give you fertilizer recommendations. I have used ANL Western Labs in the past. This link is to a list of labs. Um, and there's many, many of them. Um, the process is simple. You just kind of put a cup or so of soil in a Ziploc bag and throw it in a padded envelope and, and mail it to them with payment. 
I call them today, here is just for fun, an example of the results of a soil test. And this is my backyard, um, one of my things. 7% organic matter is huge, so I'm doing good there. I've got nothing but phosphorus. I've always had that. I don't know why. I don't add it. It's just really high naturally, and that's good to know. And the limiting factor is nitrogen. So when I fertilize, I know from this that I really don't need so much of the full NPK stuff, but I need nitrogen. And I've grown in this bed many times, and I can see that a lot of the micronutrients are so low that they don't even register. Um, that's important. So I might want some mineral supplement. And then it tells me um, information on how to how to fertilize in their humble opinion. I have my own opinions. Uh, and I have a 7.0 pH, which is pretty good for a lot of things. So that, um, I called them this morning and that soil analysis that when I started a few years ago was $35 is now $51. No, oh, that's too much. But that's about what it costs. If you are actually wanting to test for um, chemicals or toxic material in your soil, that would be a different test. It would be a different lab. And um, I have no idea what it would cost, but more, I'm guessing. Then the other thing I do for the soil every year, and I do it one or two times a year, usually in the spring and the fall, is add two to three inches of organic matter. That can be compost. Uh, that can be the cover crop that I dig in. Um, that could be rotted manure could be a number of things. Um, you just need to get organic matter that's broken down into and on top of the soil. And then adding organic slow release fertilizers. I like to do that before I plant. And because it's slow release, I only have to do it one time during the growing season usually. Uh, it's very effective and I like that it's slow release. And I personally like that it's organic. How much slow-release slow fertilizer do you add? Well, that's what the soil test is helping me with. And then keep the soil covered, keep it mulched, or keep growing plants on it, and do that all the time, not just through the growing season, but year-round, and you'll have better and better soil as the years go by. Then you can test your drainage. There is a simple test. You will dig a hole that is one foot by one foot. You will fill it with water with your garden hose, and then you will set the timer and wait for it to drain. If it drains within 10 minutes to 30 minutes, you're good. If it drains before 10 minutes, you have very porous sandy soil and you're gonna have trouble uh, keeping things watered and you'll need lots of organic matter. And if it has, um, it takes a longer time than 30 minutes to drain, then you have a pretty sticky clay soil and you probably also need to add organic matter. Go figure, same thing, helps everything. And since we're in planning mode, plant a cover crop around Thanksgiving. There's a whole class around that too. Um, and Thanksgiving, late November is a good time to do it. And then you'll um, cut it down and dig it in right about now, St. Patrick's Day. So make gardening a holiday all year round. Let's pick some plants. <clears throat> you know what you and your family like to eat, but do you know what those plants like to eat and what they need? Every plant's different. So the learning never ends, as Joy mentioned. And timing is everything. Um, planting at the right time is key to success. I don't know how many people I've met who have tried to plant things. For example, sweet peas. I see them blooming all over town. It's late spring. They're gorgeous. They're fantastic. I buy seeds. I try to plant them. It's summer. They die. So knowing when to plant is how you're going to be successful. Um, what is the date? Should you start them from seed or from seedling? How much room are they going to need? Do they need other particular things? For example, onions are day length sensitive. Depending on the time of year and the length of the day, they will either bulb or they will seed. And you don't want them to seed, you want bulbs. Um, basil needs a warm soil, so you need to wait forever, it seems like, to put the basil in. 
for it to be truly happy. And corn is wind pollinated. So you have to plant that in a block. Uh, sort of three by three is the minimum. These things are just something you need to know because every plant's different. Um, how you find this out? Well, seed packets, if you're, if you're starting with seeds, seed packets is a great wealth of uh, information in many cases. And seed Patrick, pa uh, packets differ. So ones that are that are um, designed for a home gardener audience and a and a rudimentary gardener audience, and the ones I think of um, that I can find most frequently is botanical interest and Renee's garden. Those both have really extensive, great information about how to grow the plant from seed. So those are good. And this is just an example of a kind of a key to the botanical interest seed packet. Then on that seed packet, because they're promoting seeds to everywhere in the country, they have no idea what your climate's like. So they have to figure out a start date for the seeds. They have to tell you when to plant. And they do that by saying, um, plant two weeks before last frost or plant when last frost is no longer a danger, or, or plant three weeks after last frost. Well, how the heck are you supposed to know what last frost is? Um, I've got a couple of tips for you here. One thing I wanna point out is that it is a moving target, last frost, <laughs> because our frost dates have changed and and our, our average temperature has, uh, in Santa Cruz, it's gone up by about two degrees. Um, in 2014, I was in a zone 9B. And today, because they, every 10 years, they reevaluate the data. Uh, we're now in a 10A zone. So we're warmer. Um, according to, I'm going to have Joy put these links into the chat so you guys can play with them. But let's go to the plant hardiness uh, zone map and just see how that works. So zone doesn't really tell you much, but I'm going to put my zip code in and see what it says. So here's the zip code. In 2003, I'm in uh, 10A. 30 to 35 degrees is the lowest it gets. And in 2012, I was in 9B, and 25 to 30 was the lowest that it got. So we're up two degrees Fahrenheit. Nice. But that doesn't tell me my last frost date. So this is something, there are lots of utilities that give you this information. It's data-driven. I'm going to show you one that I like because... It tells me I'm in Santa Cruz. It guesstimates, and this is kind of a round figure, last frost date is about February 7th. So in a perfect world, we have passed the last frost date for my front yard. Um, the first frost date, when it's going to get cold again, is December 17th. These are not firm dates, and let me tell you why. Down here, it shows you percentages. So it's all based on probability. It's not really these dates. So the probability that uh, 32 is freezing. Um, December 21st, um, it'll be 32 degrees, 90% probability that's going to happen. Uh, but there's also a 10% probability that it will freeze on March 16th. So uh, in a couple of nights, it could freeze. It could. Low probability. But that's the deal. So those are fun to play with. And just for the heck of it, I took a couple of areas. Uh, Live Oak is where I live. The summit of Santa Cruz, uh, Monterey, Watsonville, Salinas, uh, Carmel Valley. So here are some of the frost dates that I've seen. And we all have a very long growing, growing days. Um, we're very lucky with that. And frankly, hardiness or frost tenderness is 
the very least of our worries, but it does dictate some some planting schedules. So um, when you look at the seed packet and it tells you when to plant, it's giving you the earliest you can possibly start seeds. And you may want to wait a little bit to make it easier. Um, since the frost dates are a little wishy and the um, um, you just can't trust the weather, uh, it, you might get a hot spell, you might get a cold snap, you just don't know. It kind of helps to wait a little bit longer in some cases to put things in the ground. Now the seed starting directions are for starting seeds, so they're a little bit different because they might start in a container or in a greenhouse or in a situation where you can control their environment. But seeds in the ground um, or plants in the ground, I, I like to I like to wait a little bit. I like to not do it at the earliest possible convenience, with some exceptions. Um, FYI, if you are growing, if you're searching the World Wide Web for planting times, be really sure you know what region of the world you're looking at because um, that can throw throw you off. And that's why I've created this ever so exciting, really gnarly spreadsheet. <laughs> and this is a tool you all get to download. Um, it has days, it has a uh, Vegetables on one tab, flowers on another, herbs and cover crops on another. And then just so you know, when it's, you know, June and you think you're too late to plant anything, these are things you can plant in June. We, we did that one special for a, uh, for a special class we did. But let's, uh, let's see how to use it. So Looking at arugula, I want to plant arugula. Can I plant it from seed or do I have to start it in the ground? Well, I can do either. How long before I give up the ghost on the germination? If I don't see anything pop up before 14 days, then probably um, snails got it, birds got it, or it was old seed and it didn't germinate or something else went wrong. How far apart do I plant it? Well, with arugula, um, I just sort of throw it out there and then I thin to every two inches. Um, 40 days to maturity. So this little bad boy goes from seed to eating it in like a month and a week. That's pretty quick. So that's a good thing to know um, when you're going to be harvesting, especially if you are uh, succession planting and you want to have it continually across um, a period of time. What are the months I can start this seed? for fall and winter versus for spring and summer. So uh, fall and winter, I can do it September to May um, throughout, throughout the winter time. And in summer, it's nasty. You don't wanna grow arugula in the middle of the summer unless it's in a very shady corner because it, if it gets too hot, it gets really bitter. So this is a cool season crop. Down here, we have some warm season crops. And this is my gift to you. Oop. There's a couple of other calendars that we added. They're easier to get your arms around. Um, and they're, they're, they're far more general. So this one's actually quite old. We've had this around for years. Um, and it will tell you, at the bottom you can see, X equals seed in the ground, PL equals transplant. So when do you plant it uh, as a seed? And when do you plant it as a little seedling that you got at the plant store? Or a seedling that you grew from seed? So there's that. And then Monterey County has one too, but it's very, very general. So it tells you you can start in October and end in June and uh, gives you a month for harvest. So this is very, very broad. And if you turn your head sideways, you can see that it has a graphical representation of the date ranges. Okay, so when, be very important when. But now we're ready to put something in the ground. So how far apart? Um, most of us in life have started out by just sticking plants in the ground, because that's how many we had. We have six and six back. 
uh, and learned the hard way that how close is too close. It seems impossible when you're planting little cabbage seedlings or just that, that big little things that they're really gonna need an entire 12 inches of space all around them. They seem so lonely out there, but really proper spacing is important because you want airflow around the plants so they don't get um, uh, fungal diseases. You want plenty of root space and you don't want them competing with each other for water and nutrients. So getting the spacing correct is good. And here's a simple spacing chart. And then that handout we just opened uh, is also useful. And just to get an idea of what it looks like when you put lots of uh, seeds, this is, um, gosh, if you're as old as me, you remember in 1976, there was a, a square foot gardening craze. Everybody would put like little little boards or strings across their garden, and that would be one foot per square. And then you could get X many plants of each type in each little square. Um, it just illustrates how many plants you can comfortably get into a constrained space like one foot. It's also a great way to diversify. So not a bad thing. You can see there's some open corners as well. It's good to uh, not plant all your lettuce at the same time, or you're just going to have to have a huge salad party or give it to the chickens. Um, and you can see that the zucchini and summer squash are on the edge because they are gigantical and they're going to spill over into the pathways and you want to plan for that. Uh, this is kind of for the concept. Then the old decision, seed versus transplant. Well, it kind of depends on your budget and how late you are at planting and what kind of plant it is and what it prefers and uh, what you're trying to get. So seeds are less expensive than seedlings and seedlings are less likely to be decimated by snails and birds. And some seed varieties require special equipment to grow like lights and heat mats and things like that, greenhouses. Um, and seedlings can get your garden started in a day. They're just really quick, turn around and there it is. Seeds come in many, many, many varieties. You can get pretty much anything you want in a seed form, but seedling choice is limited by what's commercially available. So it is, it is a trade-off. And now we're gonna launch a little poll. Thank you. And the question of the hour is, this is a pop quiz, is now the right time to plant tomatoes from seed? And Joy, I can't see the quick poll. Something's up with me. So can you launch it and tell me what up? It's working. Yeah, but I can't see it. So just tell me what the results are. Yeah, Joy, half great. the folks are, oh, 60%. Um, I will close the poll here in the next 10 seconds if you want to guess. Right. No one's going to know your answer. Just guess. I All have right. to guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll end the poll <laughs> now and share the results. And so 28% uh, said yes. 30 you guys, 36% said no, <laughs> and 36% of the people said it depends. Nice, nice way of like, kind of spreading Nicely it all. Read oh. out. Good, good distribution. <laughs> so, so the answer is maybe. Um, I, It's a little late to be planting tomato seeds. I would do that in January or February. I would do it on with bottom heat. I would do it with lights. I would then move them to a greenhouse. I would let them get six or eight um, weeks into it. And then I would want to plant in warm soil that had at, when the nights were 50 degrees or higher um, in the evenings. So that's tricky. And I think to be absolutely certain that I'm going to get what I want. I would never put a seed in the ground in California or in this part of California. I know somebody that grows seeds in the ground 
in Hawaii, and that works pretty quick. <laughs> but you want us to always start um, solanaceous plants. So it's eggplant, tomatoes, and peppers in containers in controlled environments, and then transplant them. They are tropical perennials. So if I were gonna do it from seed, it would only be a early fruiting variety or a cherry tomato that goes quicker. And um, I would more likely at this point be buying transplants. Okay, that was fun. All right, but what about the seed? What about the plant? What about what it wants? Well, here's the deal. Um, general rule of thumb, root crops don't want to move. They don't want to be transplanted. So beets, carrots, radishes, things like that, they don't love it. And they would go directly in the ground. So you might have to wait until it's a good time for that. Um, large seeds, beans, peas, and squash, they have enough reserves and they're kind of tough enough. If you plant them at the right time, they're pretty likely to be okay if you plant them directly in your soil. Roots and tubers, no brainer. Garlic, potatoes, put them in the ground or containers. And then fast growing seeds. So lettuce is one, arugula is one, cilantro is one. There are some that just are so quick that, you know, you'll sow them and five to 10 days later, they've popped up and uh, you're good to go. Again, depends on the temperature, the soil temperature in particular. Um, plants that are better by container are slow growing top tropicals. We just talked about that. And varieties that you are, you're coming in on the end of the range that you can plant them. So it's that little date range and you're kind of close to the end. You should probably hedge your bets and not try and start from seed. And then, um, if they're hard to start, so a lot of flowers in particular, tiny little seeds are like dust. Um, those generally need a more controlled environment to do well. Otherwise you kind of put them out there and forget they're there and bam, they're gone. We're gonna talk a little bit about layout and optimal use of the real estate. All right, rows. People are used to grandma's rows or farmer's rows. Well, that's because a tractor has to go down the middle of it with big wheels. Um, this is the least efficient use of space. Uh, to remember that you need walking around room. So you would need 408 square feet to get 100 square feet of planting space in rows. Not recommended unless you have a giant field. And awesome you if you have that. Uh, then beds. People tend to do beds. You do not have to put a border around beds. You can just dig beds and uh, walk on a path. Um, but it's tidier this way. People in suburban yards tend to like uh, having a little constrained border around their, their beds. And again, you got the walking around space, but it's a better use. So these beds are three by 11 and you need 255 square feet to get 100 square feet of, of planting space. So there's still, still a lot of room gets devoted to just the space around the garden. Probably the most efficient use is this keyhole shape. Um, you need 216 feet to get 100 square feet of planting space. And I really like the image with the very easy to acquire cinder blocks and uh, sitting on a lawn. Anybody can do this. You can do this. Uh, it's not too deep, so you don't need to pay too much money for potting soil. I think it's a great design. More important tips for you. Don't plant the same crop year after year in the same place. That is an invitation to soil-borne disease and pest problems. Um, tomatoes in particular, also basil, are susceptible to fusarium wilt and verticillium wilt. These are bacterial and fungal infections that can, um, once it's in your soil, it's in your soil. So it's really, really hard to get rid of uh, by any means, chemical or otherwise. And once you've you know, got it, then you can't ever plant a tomato there again. 
um, because they just dry up and die, right? As they're beginning to fruit. It's hor horrible. <clears throat> and I've had it happen. Um, yeah. Some plants need lots of nitrogen. Let lettuce is one of those. And brassicas, which is your cabbage family plants. Um, others have nitrogen to burn. They actually suck. This is the legumes or the bees and pea, beans and pea family. They actually suck nitrogen out of the air, uh, put it in their roots, have a conversation with some beneficial bacteria, and then create little nitrogen nodules that become available in the soil as nitrogen. So when you um, alternate between those, it's much better for the soil. And then we talked about cover cropping or letting it lay fallow. If you don't want a cover crop, you can always just put like big stack of leaves um, over the winter um, or manure or potting soil or uh, compost of some kind. So you want to mulch. I use, I, like, I use a lot of straw too, bales of straw. But there's a whole class for cover cropping. So take that. Happens in the fall. So in our survey, one of the things that people were asking about is companion planting. And um, just the key takeaway here, diversity is the key to a healthy garden. Um, if you, again, have lived long enough, you remember a book called Roses Love Garlic, published in 1983. Everybody was talking about what to plant and what to plant it with to maximize the health of their garden plants. It wasn't science-based, it was more um, observing and um, anecdotal evidence, um, but there are some actual systemic scientific um, approaches to uh, companion planting that are being researched now. <clears throat> and this link is a link to a really awesome document about companion planting from a scientific perspective. Um, so I'm going to go over the key uh, elements. There's uh, physical spatial, which means, you know, they occupy space in different places. So sunflowers, for example, they're very tall. They like a lot of sun. Cucumbers, they like a little shade. If they get too hot, they get bitter. Both of them are summer crops. They grow at the same time of year. They have similar water needs and they complement each other. So you can grow them interplanted side by side. If you only take one thing away today, so not plant flowers. Flowers will attract pollinators. Flowers will att attract beneficial insects that eat the bad insects. So any vegetable garden needs to have some flowers too. And that's a great way to intercrop or companion plant. Um, symbiotic nitrogen fixation. We just talked about that mechanism. For example, lettuce and beans. Lettuce needs lots of nitrogen, and uh, you can plant. You can alternate with legumes, and and basically feed the lettuce. Then there's something called modifying the root zone. We do this for weed suppression, water retention, stuff like that. Pictured in the corner here is three sisters. It, a lot of people have heard of this corn, squash, and beans all planted together. The corn provides shade and a structure for the beans to climb up. The beans provide nitrogen and the squash suppresses the weeds with its big leaves. If you do this, you have to alter planting distances for everything. So um, I would look into this and uh, read up on it before just trying to cram everything together because the spacing is very different. And then final important thing, biochemical pest suppression. Um, marigolds to deter nematodes is the example, but um, some plants make secondary compounds that produce exudates that suppress damaging organisms. For example, I planted a cover crop of Kodiak mustard, which is high in glucocyanate. I don't even, I can't even say it. And that's a biofumigant for soil-borne diseases and nematodes. And I put that in the pot that I grew the, the tomato in. So we'll see if that uh, prevents me from getting any tomato diseases. You wanna to plan for disaster. 
no matter what, you know, if you're depending on the yield to eat, um, you have to assume that you're going to lose 10 to 30 percent from the usual suspects. Okay, we're going to quickly go to the online tool shed of other tips and tricks. These are um, fancy things. So the square footage calculator, I just put it in there in case you wanted to do a round bed. So usually you calculate square feet, length by width, it's not hard. Um, but if you have a triangle or if you have a, a, a circle, and some people like to do circles, this is a tool that allows you to do that. And this is a fun tool that lets you, um, if you provide the spacing and the square feet, it'll tell you how many plants you're gonna get into that space. So that's good when you're say buying expensive seedlings. Johnny's Seed Company has amazing library of uh, uh, calculators and utilities and tools for scheduling. And that's really designed for farmers, but it's useful. It's great. Here's a days to maturity uh, chart, and I'll just pop this open quick. The statewide planting guide, that's the tiniest thing ever right now. Um, it's, it's, a, it's general in terms of its regions, but it gives you amount to plant for four persons. It gives you distance, and it gives you the best uh, temperature, and then how to preserve it. I think that's pretty cool. So now we know a lot of things. We know what we're planting and what they're right for the season. We've got our site all figured out. We've got our sun sorted, and we've uh, maybe oriented our bed north to south. Um, we know where to find what we need. Let's make a bed. All right, so this is, it's in one foot squares, one in, and this is a half foot, um, just for your convenience. Here I have the plants I'm hoping to plant here and their spacing. So looking at this list of plants and telling me in the chat, what is the plant that you need to think about first when thinking about the structure? I am not hearing anything from you guys. Okay, we have head lettuce. We have big plants. What would be a big plant on this list? Lettuce, not the big plant. Peas, we have a winner. Peas are the big plant. Now, what I would normally do, I'm going to do this. What I would normally do with peas is I would grow them up a trellis. So I would do something like this, right? Right, except now I have a problem. I can't reach in through the peas to get to the middle of the bed. So I'm gonna miss out if I, I reach from this end, I can't reach more than two feet. I go from this, I can't reach more than two feet. I can't reach them more. So the three uh, on the left, right-hand side, the three squares, I will not be able to reach them to plant them or do anything else with them. Um, so I'm gonna throw away the peas idea. And I'm going to try a teepee of peas. And I got it on the north side. And now I'm going to plant some herbs with it. Okay, these herbs are going to get as much sun as possible because um, the peas are tall and they're behind them. Um, I have my heads a little. Let's throw, throw some spinach in there. Yum, love spinach. There are some summer varieties that I recommend. And then head lettuce and leaf lettuce. I've got a couple of blocks here. Now, um, I, can you guys tell me how many head lettuce are gonna go in here? Each square is a foot. Four! Martha wins again, yay! All right, so there's, only, there's gonna be four heads of lettuce and they're all gonna be ripe the same day if I plant them on the same day. So if I don't want to have a giant salad party, I'm going to plant some of the head lettuce, some of the leaf lettuce. And then two weeks later, succession planting is easy in a backyard garden. 
you just plant every two weeks, whether it's keeping the carrots coming, the arugula, the lettuce, whatever, spinach even, uh, for a, for the duration of the season that they can grow, um, that's what you do. And then getting out of here quickly, I've got peas here and I put them on the wrong side of the bed, right? No, I didn't because I wanted to shade this ar arugula. I want it to have the shade of the peas. So I put it in an alternate location. We have just designed a garden analog style. Now I'm going to hand it over to my good friend. I'm going to stop sharing. Joy, who's going to take us through some non-analog digital proper tools. You're muted, my dear. <laughs> Can you share the uh, the next two slides? Can I share the next two slides? Yes. Yeah, I can share again the next two slides and find them. That shouldn't be hard. Oh, no. Okay, okay. well, not that one. But So okay. we're including a table here of some online uh, planning applications um, that we thought were, that have been like on different reviews and things um, that we both uh, reviewed for the uh, uh, recently. And there's a few we wanted to highlight. Uh, there's the Gardener Supply Kitchen Garden Planner, and those are free tools. It's easy to use, but it's web only, um, and it has a very limited function. Also, you know, it also tells you, um, you know, how many cubic uh, feet of uh, soil you need to fill a bed. Um, also, Smart Gardener is also uh, something that people seem to use, but there's no free free trial. Um, and oops, I did not update the price on that, but that price has gone up. It's uh, not as affordable, but still affordable, and it's fairly easy to use. Uh, there are now new apps that are uh, coming online. They're they're pretty. They're really cute. Uh, Planter.garden is where you would find that. There's a free version. You get one garden. Um, and uh, it seems like they're kind of starting up. So they have this really great pricing of like $12 a year or $50 for a lifetime. Um, it's pretty basic, easy to use, really cute graphics, but there's only like 80 plants and there's no harvest info, but they are adding more features, but it's real, that's an easy one to use on your iPad or mobile device. Um, and then Grow Veg is kind of the um, high end for the home gardener. Um, planning app, garden planning app, and it's fully featured. It's not the easiest to use, but the, we're gonna be doing a little demo here in a few, in a few. Um, can you go to the next slide? They have a, a seven day trial and then it's about $35 a year. And then here's a little more information about each of those um, that has a little more, uh, that calls out the different features, which ones have trials. Um, does it have a frost date? Can you? Some of them have are tied into seed companies, and so you can buy the seeds directly from the app. Some of them have a community where you can, or a Facebook group, um, or some kind of forum. And uh, Smart Gardener has a succession plan, but the other ones don't. And um, and then some of them have journals, which is really nice if you want to if you want to not do analog. Um, and an actual paper journal, uh, Grow Veg, Smart Gardener, uh, Planter also has a journal function. And then we've added 10.com, and this is really interesting, but there's a, uh, it's an actually, uh, it's a web app, I guess you would say, for kind of small, small farmers. Um, so it's actually farm, there's a lot of things that are, you know, how do you market um, really calculating yields and your income, um, succession plantings and analytics. And we thought that we, should, we would throw that in just as a comparison. Next slide. Okay, so we'll be doing, a, I'll do a, a, a live demo of this, but I wanted to show you kind of one, give you a screenshot of one salad bed and one salsa bed on the grow veg. And this is on the planning view. And you can see that uh, it looks really cute. You can add your bed uh, to your specifications. Um, and 
you, there's lots of different options here um, that can be confusing, but it's a pretty cool app. Uh, next slide. But the cool part about a lot of these apps is that then you get a plant list. And um, you can see here that on the plant list, it'll show you not only the, you can, you can specify a variety, but it also tells you kind of spacing. And let's see, the blue is uh, when you sow it from seed. The green is when you can plant it from transplant and the orange, the rust colored one is uh, when you can harvest. So as Delisa said, kind of all throughout, um, our, our climate is very unique and you need to take these recommendations, especially the planting out and harvest with a kind of grain of salt. And that's why master gardeners are here, your fellow gardeners are here, uh, you, the local nurseries are here to kind of set you straight Straight because these are very general for 9B and there's a lot of variation depend even within 9B even within our three counties Santa Cruz Monterey and San Benito counties and so there'll be some adjustments so um, I just wanted to give that caveat these are sort of guidelines rough guidelines um, then the other thing is that some in some cases we can in the fall since we have such a long growing season there are some opportunities to have a uh, a fall a fall crop of say like peas and things like that. So um, not all of the apps have that that uh, information. And then next slide. So Delise and I wanted to call out again the tomatoes and this really inf interesting information about zucchini. And it says that uh, you can have if you can read the second line up there. It says that you can plant another set. Of tomatoes in August, and Delise, feel free to jump in here, and then harvest in November. And uh, I don't think that there's enough time for that to happen, unless, uh, well, not yeah. not in my foggy summer, no way. And I'm in Aptos, so that's a no. That's a hard no for me. Maybe if you're more inland, it's possible. Um, and then it's really interesting that the zucchini you can do a second uh, a second planting. Um, of transplants in September, which I know some folks do that. Um, they do a second planting, but you really need to know your your microclimate. You know, someone in Bonnie June is going to be different from someone in Aptos, which is going to be some different from someone in Santa Benito County. Um, so we always say take take this info with a grain of salt, particularly with tomatoes, and um, could work if we have like late summer heat. Did you have anything to add to that? Least. No, I think that's right, that you can never count on anything in terms of weather. <laughs> so if there's one thing, plan. yeah, if there's one thing, tomatoes are persnickety in our, in, our, in our area and don't plant them out too early because there will be heartbreak um, and possible diseases. So that's the one thing if you remember from all the stuff, don't plant your tomatoes too early. You can always grow cherry tomatoes. They they seem to work. Yes, yeah. you can count on cherry tomatoes. So that's that's true for me too. <laughs> All right, um, I'm gonna continue. Right, Take it. Yes, let me get to the window here. All right. So this is the grow veg um, plan view and i don't know if you can see my can you see my cursor here it says all months yeah. and you'll see that this is like looks like a hot mess actually um <laughs> and this is like the everything and i tried to recreate a little bit of what uh delise had said earlier um with her her beds with like you know there's a trellis with peas and this is like all the months but what's kind of cool is that you can if you're planning really month to month you can actually go through the year and you'll see that I have a cover crop here and you no, know, we have some empty space here and go through each month here. And then you'll see that I'm introducing warmer crops in this bed. And I need to take this, these trellises off. 
And you'll see that we added squash in this bed. And that's kind of cool, right? Um, and you'll see here that things have changed. And I'm, I just want to say from a companion planting, um, from a companion planting standpoint, I am one of those people who plants flowers like everywhere. And my favorite, my two favorite things are marigolds and alyssum. And I just like let them hang off the edge of my bed. And the alyssum is, you can like totally see like all the beneficial insects stopping by. And I have had minimal um, aphid problems in my beds um, for years because I just let them seed. I also let the cilantro go to seed. I let the parsley, at least one plant, um, I let go seed for cilantro and parsley, anything with like the umbels, uh, which is the kind of flowers that kind of have the, all a mass of flowers. They're called umbels, and those are really fantastic for beneficial insects as well. So it's not only just herbs, but you know, if you not only flowers, but you can let herbs go to seed. The cool thing about cilantro for me is like you can, so cilantro seeds are called coriander and you can snack and have kind of a flavor bomb in your mouth when you're uh, walking by, if you let it go to seed. And then if you let it go to seed and you let it fall, then you can have, I'm, I'm kind of a messy gardener. So I uh, let it reseed and just do what they want to do. So I'm kind of a laissez-faire um, gardener personally. So one thing I wanted to show you, there's two things I want to show you besides that is that if you wanted to plant something and maybe it's like, can someone just throw out a vegetable that maybe wants to plant in this empty bed here? Any vegetable whatsoever? What's your favorite vegetable? Delise, can you let me know if anybody? I'm looking. Is anyone? Green beans. So beans. Green beans. Okay, you can see there's like all kinds of beans. Um, I will assume that these are whole beans. So you just click on this, you know, put it here. And in this app, oops. ooh, you can like have a ooh. whole row of beans and it'll tell you exactly how many beans you have. You have 13 plants, you click on it. It'll tell you the planting times here. It tells you the, who the companions are. Um, and you can show there's like five more companions. Um, and I think that's so, it's like just really useful so you don't have to go to look it up. It's right there and the, right there. And it then has all the row spacing. And you can also, this is what I had done. I'd specified when I want to have it in the ground, um, but you don't need to do that. So this is a shortcut, um, very much a shortcut uh, to all the things that Delisa was talent talking to you about, uh, about looking up the plants, looking up how much space they need, um, I would also encourage you to like talk to your neighbors if you see someone with a vegetable garden, like what varieties work for them. Um, we have we have um, suggestions, but you know it's going to be dif uh, different based on your on your microclimate. Okay, and then of course I need this tool, and then here's the plant list one more time. You just click here, and then there's this plant list that tells you this how when to sow them indoors the when to put them outside um, and then the harvest. But again, take the harvest part with a grain of salt. salt. Yes, remember that grain of salt. Um, and then in this case, I had just have beds and teepees, but there's a whole parts list. Um, and here's your journal, did not put anything in the journal, but it's nice to have notes. Um, I learned late that uh, it's nice to have notes because I think in the, in, during, this, during the working season, I'm gonna remember that these tomatoes work really well. And then all I remember is that sun golds do well in my yard. And I don't remember all the varieties because I try like 10 every year. So um, I recommend, we recommend that you do a journal, whether it's analog or digital. And if the, if the app is too much, you can always do analog on paper. You can map out your things on an Excel spreadsheet or PowerPoint or something. So you don't need to spend money. There are free trials on the on the table for like three of them. You can just try it out and see how it feels. Um, let's see. I think it's really cool how you can drag around the space and uh, just add them at the right spacing. That's yes, cool. yes. 
And they have the, there's also a, a square foot mode, which it kind of, it's okay. I kind of like this one better, but it'll just say four. So it's not as pretty, but it'll tell you. <laughs> and I think it's sort of like anticlimactic. Um, but, um, you know, <laughs> to, to, to do that, I think it's not very fun. So anyway, um, looks like we have 15 minutes left. And um, we've got a few, a few up and coming things, slides. Yes. And then we'll do Q well, and let a. me stop my share. Thank you. Thank you for learning that app. I think I'm going to try it this year. And I don't know, this guy's all over the internet. The other thing it has is access to all the videos that he's made. He yes. gives really yes. great advice. All right, Trank, what's coming? Okay, let me uh, just add for everyone, we're going to tell you a few things um, we want you to know about, and then we're going to get to your questions. So just hang in there another minute. We are going to send you an evaluation. We're always very interested in what you thought of our classes, looking for recommendations for new classes. So please look for, you'll get an email in a couple of days. It'll have the vid the evaluation in it, and it will also have a link to this, all this information, the entire uh, slide deck, as well as the, the uh, whole video, if you want to watch it again. Um, and then we have some upcoming classes. Some of you have asked about pests. I've seen things about uh, bunnies and other things. Uh, and I invite you to come up and talk to us on April 7th. We're going to do a a spring pest management, because once you get these plants in the soil, you will have some pests. So um, some of the things that if you're just building your beds, you might want to think about um, some pests, particularly around exclusion. So there's certain things that you're just going to want to keep birds out of the bed and rabbits out, out of the bed much better than and gophers out of your bed. So um, we'll talk about all of those. And then we're having a plant sale, a Master Gardener spring plant sale, where we're actually uh, selling some starts, uh, all kinds of perennials and vegetable starts. So look for that. There's a link there to our website. And more is coming up in April. We're going to have a hands-on vegetable gardening uh, class and a composting class. So once you've joined our email list, then you'll hear about those um, classes as, we, as they come up. Next one. And you will be joined because you've taken this class. So you can opt out if you receive email that you don't want. And then remember that we have a really great Master Gardener hotline on our website. Uh, it is staffed by Master Gardeners who love to do research. And so you can, if you're having a problem, uh, take a picture of the plant and put post it and ask them questions tell them about the problem you're having, they will either know it right or off or research it for you. It's one of the things about Master Gardeners, we do know how to find the answers even if we don't know them. So, okay, let's let's go back to some questions. Um, I'm gonna take us back to kind of the beginning of the class, Delise and Joy. Um, one of the first questions was, we didn't talk about depth of soil in your raised bed. Could you advise on that? Well, I always recommend that raised beds have an open bottom or that they're, you know, they, they sit on top of soil. Now there might be hardware cloth to keep the gophers out on top of that, but the roots can still get through that. Um, so, so if you have the entire earth under your raised bed, then depth of soil is not such an issue. If you have a really constrained, you know, up on stilts kind of, uh, bed that you are working with, then you can grow some things in a foot of soil, but two feet much better. So right. it, it kind of depends on the plant. Yeah, great. Okay, and then we were talking about the orientation and you recommended having your rows go north to south um, and, excuse me, uh, the beds. And one of the questions was, is that the long end that's going north to south or the short end? I think it has to do uh, with the rose itself, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's the long end. So the long part, the longest part is going north to south. Great. 
And just a repeat on the drainage time for the soil test. Was that 10 minutes? What was your time? The, the sweet spot, you want to be between 10 and 30 minutes. 10 and 30. Okay, good. Um, and then as you touched on tomatoes and, you know, the diseases, uh, questions came up about tomato pots. You know, do you need to sterilize those pots every year? Do you, should you even reuse your tomato pots uh, from year to year? What do you recommend? Joy, let me know if you want to weigh in on any of this stuff. Um, but I recommend you use a new pot every year. I recommend new soil every year. You can use a 10% a bleach solution to clean out a pot if it's not wood or a porous kind of a pot, but you're running a little bit of a risk. So eh, yeah, new I, soil at least every year. Yeah, I wouldn't and, risk it with tomatoes, yeah, right. in our, yeah. especially in our area. At least new soil and stair and cleaning the pot really well. Yes. It's not just starting a new pot. Okay. And don't forget those wonderful fabric pots. They're three dollars and you can get a 25 gallon one. And they're one year use. Um those those are cheap and easy. That's great. Ugly. Ugly. <laughs> yeah. Put, put them in place before you before you fill them full of dirt though. Yeah, put them where they're gonna be. Don't try to yeah. carry them around. I'll do it. <laughs> I think this question is in one of the handouts that is included in the slide deck. What types of flowers are best for food crops? I think that's on one of the links, isn't it not? You know, we can include a pollinator specific plant list for flowers. Okay, great. Uh, one of the handouts has, you know, some flowers, a bunch of flowers, but there's a million flowers in the world, but Think about the flower, think about the flower as a landing pad for the insect. So that would be yarrow is like, whoa, a little surface area they can land on. Or anything that's a kind of daisy shape, whoa, we can land on that. Those are the best flowers for pollinators. Those are the best flowers. I mean, I like I said, <laughs> you can let, let things go to seed, like uh, your chives you know, that's a really great one too. So there's a lot of things that maybe you don't need to plant a special flower. You just like pick one of your herbs and plants and just let it go. And then voila, you don't, you know, you have, you have lots of bees and happy, happy, happy insects. But we'll put together a list or find a, find something we, more specific. We have a list we can okay. invoke. Okay. Yeah. Now we have some, uh, uh, problem, pest problems or disease problems, like someone getting powdery mildew on her curcubits, cucumbers and others in August. Any advice? Mm. Well, it's August. So that tells you something it tends to be towards the end of the season. And we'll call it uh, August. it's August. August. <laughs> yeah. August. It's so it could be fog. It, it could be powdery mildew that actually likes dry conditions. It could be overhead watering. You don't want to get the leaves too wet uh, because that invites fungal growth. But mostly I'm thinking the plant saying, I'm done. I'm ready. Euthanasia. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm ready to go because they really have a kind of a short lifespan. And when they're when they're good to go, they start uh, crisping up and, and getting diseases and they just die back. That's my experience as well. Okay. Um, maybe we should also include one of our handouts on cover crops because there were a couple of questions about that, but we will do a class later in the season about cover crops. So look for that as well. Um, so how about metal troughs? They are so popular nowadays. I have one in my garden. Unique growing issues? I can mention one, they tend to retain the water, even if you put holes in the bottom. So do be careful with your watering. Um, just be, recognize that, you know, they're gonna, the soil is gonna hold that moisture um, much more than an open bottom bed. Anything? Joy, you've got this. I have, I have both. And I find that the trough one is, is a little bit problematic for me for the same reason, it doesn't drain properly. Um, but yes, I have an open bottom of those. Uh, so we have mentioned some brands, but we do not endorse said brands, but I have a birdies, those birdies beds. 
that are available around and uh, they're they get the metal shipped to you. ones, the metal yeah without the metal the metal ones with the corrugated yeah. um, right and they're just they're great i think they're great um they're easy to pop up um, anyone can build them but yeah I, I think in that case that i think maybe the question was you know also you know any uh Any problems with chemicals or anything leaching? Not for those beds. I don't know if it would about the uh, aluminum. Wasn't there something about the aluminum beds or not? Um, I haven't seen anything on that myself. Um, so now it's uh, it also remember though when you're using those metal beds without the bottom that you still want to get that uh, hardware cloth in for the gophers. I mean around here, you really. I'm replacing a couple of beds this year because of gophers. I mean, really, if you put even after about 10 years, if you've got it attached, the gopher cloth attached to wood, the wood starts deteriorating and the gophers can still get in. So just to remember that. Um, another question is like, how um, how often should we replace the soil in raised beds? Um, I'm gonna let Delise grab that one because I know she loves to build Well, the soil. <laughs> I like to, I like to, the soil. Um, I think that people usually put purchased soil into raised beds, and that can compact like any soil, uh, given enough time and water and pressure and gravity. Um, so doing what we do in a not raised bed or in, in the ground, um, the cover crops, the adding uh, compost, Um, keeping it kind of nicely tilled a little bit, uh, mulching every single time you plant. All those things help add the organic matter that turn it into a lively ecosystem instead of a bunch of dead dirt. So I would do that. Yeah. So think about you're, you're working that soil and feeding it, building it to feed your plants. So you shouldn't have to replace it, but you do need to take care of it. Mm -hmm. um someone has some it, trying to figure out where to place things in her, her beds in her garden she has some wind uh as well and sloping any recommendations on those two issues well it's if there's a slope you're gonna have to come up um with you can either you can either grow on the slope at an angle, but as we do at the UCSC uh, garden, we are forever like moving soil from the bottom to the top because it just kind of slumps down there. So it's a very maintenance, high maintenance issue. I've seen a lot of gardens on, on slopes that have custom built beds where there's a wooden kind of retaining wall that holds it that's shorter on one side and taller on the other. That's probably the best permanent solution That's what the, And in terms of, I was going to say, that's go ahead. what the permaculture folks would say is to do it on the contour, along the contour. Um, Do it all the contour. Yep. And for wind, I would plant something tall in the direction the wind is coming from. To a windbreak. To Something a wind. gorgeous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not necessarily vegetable. <laughs> Or you could. It could be gorgeous and vegetable. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a question here about arched cattle panels. I'm afraid I don't know what they are. Do either of you? We could ask Mark. I do. I... Okay, great. <laughs> Go for it, Joyce. Joy, you're nodding. You want to answer that one? So it was the question, like, how do you do it? Well, he wants to add a few arched cattle panels to his, his beds. Should they be oriented for planting on the north side and the south side? Uh, I think it depends on what you want. Um, and so here's the it depends, but you know, generally in the north, because it's going to be holding something, you know, that's climbing or tall. Um, ah, got it. Uh, right. So, like, you know, you have peas going over. It might shade things unless you that's what you want, and you want to put your your cool season, your salad garden under it um, during the summer. So I've actually done this in my front yard between those two beds on the insides of both and then had the arch go over them and you can walk through and it's a little tunnel of love. Children come in off the street and they want to run through it and you plant sweet peas or you plant beautiful beans and peas. And it is an awesome way to get 
um, to use the space well and to use um, a, a flexible but semi-permanent um, trellis system. So Do you use I, um, cattle panels though? I think he's, uh, it's, they're very hard to bend, but you use something to different, bend. right? You, you need to, yeah, I, I used hog wire. I used a less firm, you know, stiff um, metal. Um, I think if I did it again, I would do it with, with, uh, cat, with hog, with cattle panels, but there's ways to bend them that you just, you, you anchor them on one side really hard, really firmly with a, a deep, uh, a T -post. pillar, T post, exactly. And, um, zip tie it on or something and then it's not that hard to just bend it over and zip tie it on the other side you just don't want it to go boing and fling you out of, into the neighbor's yard <laughs> <laughs> they are kind of dangerous yeah that kind way of, that's kind of them up. And yeah, you can ratchet kind of it down i think um so don't make the bed so close that you have to like do this like really insane curve just make it a little wide so it's easy easy on you a wide and gentle arch and in terms wide of wide and gentle arch think think of it as it's not going to be if it's between two beds it's not going to be on um the north or the south it'll be on both so it'll be just a, a shadow barrier for whatever's on the north side okay great that was fun. <laughs> great and what size pot do you recommend for tomatoes As big as possible, huh? I always use a, I use a, about the size of a wine barrel, one of those half wine barrels. And that yeah. makes for a happy tomato. But there are container tomatoes that are small varieties that are not, you know, they're, they're bred to be grown in containers. And you can, you can go smaller. You can go, you know, 15, 20 gallons of those. What are your favorite container tomatoes? Um, Renee's got a good one. Um, you're gonna make me think of varietal oh. names, aren't you? Oh, sorry, <laughs> I know you gave me a super much. Um, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I a, a question came in um, about where do you order the fiber pots and can gophers go through them? So, is there do you, do you put something under them? Um, when you put them down in your yard fiber or cloth is i guess the grow bags i think they're talking about the grow bags that you were talking about or contain okay the grow bags i go down to my cannabis grow store which is around the corner from me where they're all the rage they're everywhere um i also have seen them online they're on amazon they're all over the place i think most garden centers have them these days um and i just put them on the ground don't ever have a gopher issue but it's also a way to put a plant in sunshine when you don't have a good sunshine area if you've got hardscape if you have a patio or something you can use them on a surface like that okay any other questions coming in uh, Joseph is sharing some uh, experience with his growing uh, different herbs in containers, which is great. Um, he said he has some mixed um, results. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things is we're all going to have mixed results at times and just keep working at it. Um, sounds like he's doing all much of the right stuff. So cherry tomatoes in containers are really, you know, it, it's hard to get. Uh, a full, large tomato growing uh, in a, in a container. So, and, and then you need baskets, well, et cetera. There are slicing tomatoes you can grow in container. I do have a variety for that. It's called stupiche. Stupiche, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is, um, it's nice kind of baseball size. It's not a giant beefsteak, but it's, it's good. It's a determinate tomato. There's determinate and indeterminate. Indeterminate means it's a wildly vining thing that kind of grows everywhere. It's crazy. It keeps going and going and going. And determinate is it grows to a certain distance and branching. And then 
it stops and then it fruits all at once. So those are better for um, better for containers and better for cool summer places like us on the coast. Great. Okay, other questions? Anything else to add? Looks like there's a question about best tomatoes for our area. And I know you just mentioned one. Um, well, you have I a came up with one last year for the plant sale. And I have no idea where that is, but we'll see what we can find it. Yeah, we'll find it and send it out to you. Yeah, there are okay. lists like that. We'll, we'll find one for you. It's the nice thing about joining one of our classes. We send you lots of information that comes up afterwards. So <laughs> look for our email. Okay, anything? D Delise, Joy, thank you very much. There's lots of good comments here. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, I guess I have one thing to say um, to kind of close out is that, um, you know, there's no perfection in gardening. There's heartbreak in gardening. You put the full gamut of the human experience in gardening. So <laughs> there is no, um, I just wanted to say it's kind of a, Orrin Martin, I was, you know, Orrin Martin from UC Santa Cruz Center for Agroecology talks about tending a fruit tree as a long conversation. And this is a long conversation with your land, your microclimate. So, you know, no perfection here. You can always ask us questions on the, the, the hotline and, um, you know, good luck to you. It's an exciting time full of possibility. So thanks for all, for all of you for coming. Thank you all. Thank you, Joy. Thank you, Trink. Mm -hmm. Goodbye, all.